Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is a bit of formation of stars. So explain how the wavelength emitted with maximum intensity from a star changes as the star changes from a nebula to a main sequence star and then eventually becoming a white dwarf. Uh, so we'll start how it changes as we go from a nebula to a main sequence. So um, to start with, if we have just a nebula, it's going to be emitting a very, very long wavelength because it's very cold. But what's going to happen is as it comes together and its GP is transferred to kinetic energy, its temperature rises. So Wien's displacement law tells us that will cause the wavelength to become shorter. And generally speaking with stars, uh, their maximum will be in the visible spectrum when it becomes a main sequence star. But it will emit some either side of it too. So then explain how it changes when it goes from being a main sequence star to a red giant. So as the star's outer layer expands, which is what we can see with the red giant, its temperature decreases or it cools. And that would cause the peak wavelength to increase towards the red end of the visible spectrum. So that's why they appear red and we call them red giants. OK, so then looking at it as it goes from a red giant to a white dwarf. So the core left behind by the helium flash is initially very hot because it's just been fusing helium. So the wavelength emitted by it after helium flash is going to get quite a bit shorter because it was red from the red giant. Now we've got the helium flash and it's going to be very hot. Uh, so we're going to get a much shorter wavelength and it's typically can even go out of the visible spectrum and you initially form a white dwarf. But over time, the white dwarf will cool down and the wavelength will get longer and longer until you eventually get to a situation where you can't really see anything at all. OK. So the sun has a surface temperature of 5500 degrees centigrade. Calculate the wavelength emitted with maximum intensity. And we've been given Wien's constant there. So um, what we can do is use our, the equation. So Wien's displacement law says the maximum intensity wavelength and the temperature are inverted proportional if the temperature is measured in Kelvin. So we can plug the numbers in and we can see that the maximum wavelength is 5.01 times 10 to minus 7 meters or 501 nanometers, which would be sort of uh, orangey, yellowy, maybe even slightly green part of the visible spectrum. Use Wien and Stefan's laws to sketch an intensity versus wavelength graph for the sun and the earth if the earth has an average surface temperature of 18 degrees. So the first thing we can do is we can use the same process we've just used to figure out the where the maximum for the Earth is. And we can see it's about um, what's sort of somewhere like 100 times bigger than that of the Sun. And using Stefan's law, we know that the Sun will be emitting a lot more power. So putting those two things together, we can draw a graph that looks like this. So the red one is for the Earth. Uh, we can see its wavelength there. If you actually calculate it, it's like 9955 nanometers. And its peak is going to be lower because it's not as hot. Whereas the sun is much hotter, so its peak is much higher. And its peak is much shorter wavelength. So that's the sketch we'd get. So the sun emits radiation with a total intensity of 6.33 times 10 to the 7 watts per meter squared to calculate its temperature. Now, so what we can do is we can use Stefan's law here. And we've been given what the intensity is. So we've been effectively given L over 4 pi r squared. And we can put in Stefan's constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. And then plug all the numbers in, take the fourth root of it, giving us about 5,780 Kelvin, which is pretty close to the surface temperature of the sun if you actually look it up. So if the total power of the sun is 3.83 times 10 to the 26 watts, calculate the radius of the sun. So uh, intensity is the power per unit area. Uh, that means that uh, power divided by intensity would give us the area. And if we then divide that by 4 pi, square root it, that should give us 
the radius of the sun, which comes out as 6.93 times 10 to the 8 meters, which again is pretty close to the value you get if you just look it up. Okay, so therefore calculate the escape velocity on the surface of the sun, and we've been given what the mass of the sun is. So escape velocity is the essentially tells us the amount of kinetic energy we'd need to escape from the gravitational potential field or increase the electric potential energy to electric potential energy, gravitational potential energy to zero. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to equate the kinetic energy of the change in GP. It's going to finish with zero GP, start with GMM over R. Now we can plug our value of mass in and the R we've just calculated, giving us an escape velocity of 6.2 times 10 to the 5. When the sun finally runs out of hydrogen, it will expand in size by a factor of about a thousand. Calculate the new escape velocity. So we could go and do all that calculation again, or what we can do is figure out using this equation, if we multiply r by a thousand, essentially that's going to mean the velocity gets divided by root 1000, which gives us 2 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. Okay. Okay, so the Milky Way is estimated to have a mass of matter of 2 times 10 to the 10 solar masses, one solar mass being the mass of the Sun. If the speed of the Sun in orbit in the Milky Way is 230 kilometers per second at a radius given, show that it's not possible without the existence of dark matter. So essentially, if it's in orbit, what that means is that the force due to gravity would be equal to the centripetal force. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange that to calculate what mass you need in order to have this condition. So you plug the numbers in, remember to convert from kilometers per second to meters per second, and then you come up with a mass required of 2 times 10 to the 41, which is effectively 9.8 times 10 to the 10 solar masses. Okay, so this is about five times bigger than the mass we actually of matter we actually have so we can see that we're clearly missing four fifths of the material which is where dark matter fits in okay okay so explain using the doppler effect and newton's laws of motion why something similar to dark energy must exist to explain the current state of the universe so let's first talk about what happens or what we receive on earth so electromagnetic radiation we receive from earth from any distant star has been redshifted which means its wavelength appears to be greater than the light light was when it was actually emitted by a star so that's the first thing so the doppler effect explains this because what it tells us is that that object is moving away from us and that's causing the redshift and what we also notice is the furthest stars have the largest redshift. So the Doppler effect tells us they are moving away faster. And what that tells us is the expansion of the universe is accelerating over time. And this is where the problem with Newton's laws comes in. So generally speaking, the forces acting on the, the universe are gravity. So it doesn't matter if it's dark matter or matter, they have an attractive force which cannot explain why the universe is expanding. So dark energy is used to explain how objects can be accelerating away from one another even though the resultant force from gravity appears to be acting to bring them together. And that solves the problem because Newton's second law tells us the resultant force and acceleration should be in the same direction. So that's the problem with Newton's law, and dark energy is incorporated to try and fix that issue and explain why it's expanding. Okay. Okay, so another piece of evidence of the expansion of the universe is the wavelength of cosmic microwave background radiation. So the universe has expanded approximately 1100 times since electrons first recombined with protons to form hydrogen and the universe first became transparent to light, which is why it still exists now. So if its wavelength now appears to be 1.063 millimeters, that's, the, that's what we're looking at now. So what we're going to calculate is the original photon energy and therefore the original wavelength of CMBR.
So we've got the ionization energy of hydrogen, and we've got an equation there. So what we can do is calculate photon energy by finding the difference between the energy at the ionized state and the energy at the ground state, which is what you can see there. So once we've got the photon energy, what we can do is then calculate the wavelength using this equation right here and plug the numbers in and we get a wavelength of 9.14 times 10 to the minus 8 meters or about 91 nanometers, which is um, clearly not in the microwave spectrum. That is probably in the ultraviolet, maybe even the X-ray kind of spectrum. OK, so. If we are going to get the wavelength we now see, this must have been seriously redshifted, and we can calculate by how much. So, the change in wavelength is going to be the difference between the current wavelength and what it was originally, and the original one is so small we can ignore that and just say it's basically the original one. So, then once we then we can use the Doppler effect equation to calculate the recession velocity that we are currently at, plug the numbers in, and then we can get that the recession velocity is about 3.48 times 10 to the 12 meters per second in order to have this kind of redshift. Okay. So a sneaky static universe theory promoter realizes that if they can cloud the issue long enough, the evidence of the expanding universe from CMBR will disappear. Explain why the wavelength of CMBR will continue to decrease over time until it's undetectable. OK, so the reason being that the universe is expanding and it's the expansion is accelerating so the recession velocity of all objects is increasing over time and what that means is the wavelength of cmbr will continue to increase over time until we get to a point where we can't build an antenna long enough to detect it anymore because to detect something using an antenna you need the antenna to be the same length or similar to its radiation and if it becomes too long we're not going to be physically able to do that anymore so that would be a very sneaky trick but it would actually technically work okay so two stars approximately the same temperature and size are emitting light explain how there could be black spots when no light is detected along an imaginary line connecting the two stars by considering the superposition of their progressive light waves. So a way you could in theory get black spots would be, well, if they're the stars are the same temperature, they'll be emitting the same maximum intensity wavelength and probably about the same amplitude. And that means that if they're traveling in opposite directions at the same speed, the two progressive waves would superpose to form a stationary wave, the black spots being the place where nodes form from destructive superposition. So that's theoretically how we could create these black spots. However, I just invented black spots for the purposes of the last question, suggest why in reality these black spots don't actually exist. So one of the problems with it is that stars don't emit just one wavelength, that maximum value. They emit a lot, and each of them would have nodes at different positions. Um, so you might have a black spot for one particular wavelength, but that wouldn't be a black spot for all of them. Uh, so that's one reason why. And the other thing is you'd get light from other stars at those supposed black spots. So you'd never actually get any of these things. OK. So explain why this Doppler effect equation is used when measuring the recession velocity of stars rather than this other version of the Doppler effect you encounter as part of the course. So the first reason is the recession velocity of stars is parallel to the direction of that light is traveling to us from the star because all objects are moving away from us. And that makes cosine theta equal to one. So that could be an equation, but uh, that's why it's not because it's equal to one. And the second reason is the two in the second version of the Doppler effect is used when the light is reflected back to the observer. And so the extra distance traveled due to the recession velocity is double. But the light from stars is not reflected. It's emitted by them. So we don't have the two when we're doing cosmology. 
Okay, so a flat earther does not trust the light that is collected by scientists and decides to build their own laser to reflect off distant stars to see if redshift is real or just a conspiracy. They use a circuit with an LED to emit photons that would be a laser. So this is a very basic looking laser. So here's your circuit. Okay, so the laser designed to emit a red light of wavelength 700 nanometers calculate the photon energy uh, so this is fairly straightforward uh, we can just plug them into the equation calculate our photon energy good so far calculate the activation potential of the diode and therefore comment whether the diode shown in the circuit will activate so um, activation potential basically means that one electron traveling through the diode has enough energy to cause excitation to produce a photon of the energy we've just calculated. So that means the the work done by each electron that passes through the diode needs to be equal to the photon energy. So that's why EV is that. And so if we want the activation potential, we just divide the energy by the electron charge and that gives us an activation potential of 1.78 volts. So that looks pretty good because we're supplying an EMF of 10 volts to the circuit. Uh, so that's fine, except if you actually look at the circuit you'll see the led is in the wrong direction and so it won't activate even though it's the right value and that's why you don't get a flat earther to build any science stuff for you okay so the led direction is now reversed because the flat earth get gets a real scientist to come fix their mistakes calculate the resistance of the variable resistor for the led current to be five amps so uh, first of all what we can do is calculate the potential difference across the resistor if the LED has actually activated. So we know the activation potential, so that leaves 8.22 across the resistors. The current therefore in the 4 ohm resistor is going to be 2.056 amps. So if we want a total resistance of 5 amps using Kirchhoff's first law, we know there must be a current of 2.94 amps going through the variable resistor. Now we know the potential difference, we know the current giving us a resistance of 2.8 ohms. Okay, so explain how the variable resistor would have to be adjusted to achieve 5 amps if the red LED were replaced with a purple LED, because let's face it, purple is way cooler than red. So the first thing is purple photons are higher energy because they are higher frequency. And that would mean the activation potential would be higher. And that causes the potential difference across the resistors to decrease because it's a potential divider. So therefore, the variable resistance will need to be decreased to increase the current back to 5 amps again. OK, and then to finish off, calculate the minimum wavelength of radiation that this circuit could produce and identify which part of the electromagnetic spectrum it is in. So first of all, uh, let's calculate the maximum photon energy which would be this one when all 10 volts from the emf source would go to the led and then once we know that we can calculate what the wavelength is using those values and it turns out to be about 120 nanometers which is just shorter than the visible so that's going to be in the uv spectrum okay